Let's see who we get. Hopefully, we can get a game with the white pieces. Okay, we do. We do. Here we go. Okay, we're facing a Scandi. Fine. Scandi it is then. Scandalous. Scandalous. Okay, knight c3, obviously, is my recommendation. And here, black is at a crossroads. A lot of beginners, they like to give a check. Yeah, queen d4 is not a move that would be John Bartholomew approved. It just walks right into knight f3, helping us develop more pieces. Again, you can see that opening knowledge, super important at this level. And already black is in trouble. Black falling behind in development while the queen is dancing in the center of the board. Thank you, Sophie Davis, for the raid. And now black plays queen d8, and cooler heads prevail. But basically, black gifted us a free move. Now, there are several ways that we could kind of prosecute the initiative here. It doesn't always really matter the order in which you make the moves. Uh, the basic idea is you want to go d4 in order to stake a claim in the center. This move should be pretty intuitive to you. And the light squared bishop usually is developed to either c4 or sometimes d3. But, okay, the bottom line is that we have a big development advantage. We have more central control, and f6 just, like, makes these things, exacerbates the problem times 100. It's an incredibly weakening move. Um, it weakens like this color complex near the king. So it makes our next move really obvious. So in light of the move f6, we obviously want to go bishop c4. c6 pre-moved, okay. <laughs> Black continues to push their pawns. Now, actually, uh, a good moment to pause for a second. I think some of you might be tempted to go a4. But this presupposes that b5 is a serious threat, and it's not a serious threat. In fact, it's a move that I want to see. I think that it's likely to be black's next move. But why is b5 scary? You just drop your bishop to b3. And quite the contrary, the c5 square is then granted to us as a potential outpost. So ignore, complete ignore, just continue developing your pieces, castles. And we're almost ready to go after the king. Knight h6. Well, once again, if you look carefully, Bishop takes h6 is just automatic. It's begging to be played, destroying black's pawn structure completely. And now, for a lot of you, your pattern recognition is really kicking in. And if I understand how people think, 95 is probably on people's radar, radar here. And you might think that you might think that this is, you know, completely winning or leads to immediate checkmate, but it doesn't because after f takes e5. Queen h5 check, the king is able to escape into the center. So this goes back to a point I made in the previous speedrun, which is that sacrifices uh, are not a necessity when you're attacking. They're, you shouldn't sacrifice just to sacrifice. Your first instinct should be to play you know, the most simple, the most vanilla, the least risky move. And only if that approach doesn't work do you start looking for the more extravagant continuations. So there's a bunch of much simpler moves that we could play that maintain all of the perks of our position without sacrificing anything. The classiest move, the move that really, I think, represents master level thinking here is actually just to go rookie one, which may seem very anticlimactic to you, but in fact, we're setting up something really cool. We're setting up a lot of really cool things. I like this move a lot more than something like knight h4, which is also a very good move, but I'll explain after the game why the whole concept of bringing a queen to h5 is really not the only way that we could try to checkmate the king. And it's not my favorite way of prosecuting the attack. Rookie one is, is what I would call a setup move. Of course, it, as a standalone move, it should make sense to you. We're bringing the rook to a, a semi-open file. We're x-raying the king. But we're also setting up like a million different tactical ideas, such as the idea that we're going, okay, now we have quite a array of options. Now, bishop d7, what do I notice about this move? Well, it takes away the king's only escape square. So, as I've repeated many times, just because an idea doesn't work in one position doesn't mean that you need to abandon it out of principle. So, the moment that square is taken away, knight e5 wins the game on the spot. This is forced mate. Essentially forced mate. Essentially forced mate. Black can throw a bunch of pieces away, but... That's, that doesn't change anything. B5, and now we have our, our choice of checkmates, bishop f7. We can probably even play another one <laughs> um, because we're playing a couple of miniatures here. Nothing to write home about here. Um, again, I have in, in previous speedrun videos a bunch of higher level games in the Scandi. 
the basic idea to, to remember here is that black has a menu of like four or five different options. Queen a5 is the traditional main line. And at various points in previous speedruns, I think I recommended this obscure line with g3. You can dig around. It's way too early for like, you know, a long theoretical overview. Uh, the, the kind of quiet move is queen to d8. This is a decent line. Uh, this is basically what our opponent did, except our opponent gifted us an extra tempo. Um, here you go like d4, knight f3, bishop c4, that kind of stuff. And then there's this move queen to d6, which was very, very popular at like a GM level a couple of years ago. Kind of fallen out of favor. It's a dubious line. Your approach remains pretty much constant. You're going to go d4. You're going to develop your pieces and play for your development advantage. But this is just really bad. And obviously, f6 is just like a losing move. So bishop c4, c6, castles, knight h6, takes, takes. And here. So first of all, why is knight e5 not that good? Because after takes, check, king to d7. Actually, white, I think, does have a winning move in this position. A lot of you might be very tempted to go pawn takes pawn, because you're noticing that actually pawn takes pawn is also good. Because after king c7, rook a to d1, the queen is trapped. Queen is trapped. Black has to block, and you can go e6 and win the piece back with interest. So that is winning. Another option is to play queen takes e5, and the rook is trapped in the corner. This is what happens when you're lagging in development so badly. Pieces get trapped out of nowhere because there's nothing to defend them. There's no coordination. Um, but why is this necessary? We go rookie one, and we set up all of these ideas and make them much stronger. Um, my explicit concept here in response to a move like knight d7 uh, would have probably been to go knight e4 and try to checkmate him on d6. This is sort of the, the classic trap that you might be familiar with out of the Karakan. This is, I think, the most famous application is like queen e2 in this position. Ha ha ha. Knight d6 checkmate, uh, which is why you're always recommended to put the other knight on f6. So, but it's not a gimmicky move. It's, it's I think, a very high quality move. The one thing I wanted to point out here is what would have been our response to bishop g4? What would have been our response to bishop g4? Just a quick overview of a basic tactical pattern. Pause the video if you're watching on YouTube. This is an important moment. Yeah, 95 anyways is correct. But why is 95 good? It's, it's fancy. Yes, takes bishop f7 is like legal's mate. The point is you're trying to get rid of black's light squared bishop, which means now the light squares are just a total catastrophe, or as Leko would say, catastrophe. And this is just winning a, a thousand different ways. Queen takes d4, what is the most efficient win? It's check here, and then a deflection of bishop f7. And the rest you can kind of figure out on your own. But a position like this, here you can really appreciate the power of rookie one. Knight f6, checkmate is a threat. Black covers that, there's the other mate. So yeah, very overwhelming game. Black literally has nothing developed. That's that's the problem. Last thing, why didn't we play knight h4? Why is this not quite as powerful as it may appear? Because the black king actually can escape to the other side of the board. And a lot of people, they think that when a move like king d7 is played, the game is almost over. That's it. You've caused the king to start escaping. Not necessarily. Sometimes it is a very effective defensive strategy to like run the king out of the danger zone into a safer area of the board. And often what you'll find is that you burn all of your bridges trying to checkmate the king. And once it lands in, in safety, you might find that suddenly you're like, kind of like losing. Not here, of course, but in general. I have a great illustration of that. It's a game that I've shown before. This game is in my book, uh, but can't show an instructive game too many times, right? Some of you might remember this game. I, I haven't shown it like more than once, I think. But it's one of my favorite illustrations of this concept that just because the king is running doesn't mean that you're necessarily about to win the game. This is the critical moment. This is the critical moment. This is a game between two very strong GMs. It's black to play. So white's last move was rook to d3. Obviously, the idea is to play rook h3 and to checkmate the heck out of you. Okay. But look at what Anderson does. He plays the move queen to c5. Nero fiddles while Rome burns. Like, your house is burning down and you're busy making your bed. What on earth is he doing? Ilyaskas plays rook h3. What does black do in this position to come out alive? Because white is threatening, bishop takes f6, and queen takes h7 checkmate. 
Yeah, so of course, some of you probably are thinking, let's go h6. h6 is a very flimsy defense. I just played bishop takes h6 and you're busted. The correct move is king to g8. Just run with your own two feet. Ilyaskas, he takes the knight. Actually, this is a mistake, but he can't help himself. Takes, takes, king f8. The king is escaping via e7. You can't cover this square because black is controlling the e-file. So white gives another check. The king runs all the way, rook to d7, all the way back to the center where it is relatively safe. As a result, black's trump cards in this position, the bishop pair, the fact that white's king is really weak, the fact that black is threatening to play d4 and infiltrate with the queen, all of that starts to shine through, and black wins this game in the span of a couple moves. d4, queen e5, and I'll, I'll fast forward, but the bottom line is that yeah, black just black wins easily uh, once the king gets to safety. And the king ends the game on b6, which is kind of a mind-boggling thought. Hopefully that's a suitable illustration. Just because the king is running doesn't mean, you know, the game is nearing its conclusion. You have to be very careful, uh, oftentimes to kind of cut off the escape routes of the king. Okay? All right, I'm pretty tired, guys. I think this might be a good time to call it a day. Let's see. One more. One more for the road. One more for the road. All right, I promised. One more for the rotor playing smaroidina. That means black uh, current. C U R R A N T. In Russian, there's krasna smaroidina, chorna smaroidina, black current and red current. Okay. E4, E5. Let's go with the black system. But we're facing the elephant gambit, D5. Not the alien gambit, the elephant gambit. This is a more serious line than is often given credit, uh, than it is often credited with. If white misplays this, Black can get a serious initiative out of the opening. So I'm going to play kind of the, the best uh, line according to most GMs, which is to start by playing knight takes e5. e takes d5 is also a good move and also possible. There's multiple ways of getting an advantage here with the white pieces, but the line that I learned is knight takes e5. Okay, d takes e4 is wrong, I'm pretty sure. Let me think for a second. Maybe I'm getting caught in some like insane prep. Of course, I want to play bishop c4. This is this is the tempting move, but I'm somehow a little bit worried about queen d4. This would be a great opportunity for me to also brush up on the theory of this, which I haven't studied in a long time, full disclosure. So in this game, we're going to play a little bit safer. Now, what's a safer option here? How can we play safely, but to keep a nice advantage guaranteed? Nah, not queen e2. I don't like that move. We need to knight f6. That's just one move itis. D4. Yeah, exactly. D4. Just putting a pawn in the center, opening up some pieces, and solidifying the knight. Queen h4. Okay. At this point, I know it's not really prep. We ignore this move. This move does not do anything. We don't need to play g3. Some of you are probably like, let's go g3. This queen is not causing us any harm. So we can simply proceed with whatever it is that we wanted to do as though nothing is happening. So multiple things that we can do. Knight c3 is great. But at this point, I already like bishop c4 because it sets up the threat against f7, which is ignored by our opponent. And now we have a pleasant choice of what to capture with. Now, some of you probably are tempted by knight takes f7 just because it hits the rook. But bishop f7 is clearly a superior because it forces the king out of its initial square. Black loses castling rights and basically loses the game right off the bat. And there's going to be some cool tactics that we can set up here. So here there's kind of an inner battle in my brain between like the stated philosophy of the speedrun, which is always to play kind of the best move. But actually, no, here I think they correspond. Like the best move and the coolest move are one and the same. What should white do in this position? You want to keep the fire burning, which means you want to keep creating threats here. But you could also play the Russian schoolboy move, which is just to play like knight c3. But the common idea here is to move this bishop away from f7. So bishop back to c4. This is a very standard procedure that you see any time like a pawn is captured on f7 like this. The bishop drops back. Now knight f7 is threatened. And we have a much cooler threat, which hopefully we'll be able to demonstrate. And we will be able to demonstrate it. Knight f7 is not the best move in this position. Who can tell me what the best move is? Yeah, we drop bishop g5. The game is over. The queen is trapped. Boom. Obviously, queen takes g5, knight f7 is a fork. That's why we needed the f7 square to be vacated. 
And if queen h5, we can just take the queen. The knight is pinned. Yeah. Black can play bishop g4 or whatever, but it doesn't really change anything. Let's give the fork. Yeah. Nothing like that special. I mean, this was nice, but yeah, we won the queen. Probably time for our opponent to eat some current. And he resigns. Yeah, thank you to our opponents today for resigning promptly. It's funny. I have a book on the Elephant Gambit. I think this is the only book on, on this opening that's been written thus far. Or at least, maybe not the only one, but the most famous one. It was written in recently, 2020, by two serious players, uh, FM and, and IM, I think. So they basically say that Black is worse, but they find a bunch of interesting ideas to kind of revive this line. Eh, I wouldn't recommend it to anybody, though. There's better. If you want to play like a coffeehouse gambit line, there, there's better ways to do that than to, you know, than to try an elephant gambit. So after knight takes e5, d takes e4 is not the main move. Let's see if any opening experts in the chat can tell me what is black's main move after knight takes e5? What is black's main move here? And we'll kind of analyze this together. So it's not queen e7. If black plays queen e7 here, we're going to go d4 and cement the knight on e5. And if black plays f6, this is a very instructive moment. So pay attention. A lot of you are immediately going to be like, oh, puzzle rush pattern, queen h5, and knight takes g6. But you have to apply these patterns very carefully. This actually loses a piece to queen takes e4, and the queen comes back to take the knight. So in this position, you shouldn't be afraid to move the knight back. A lot of people are like, but, 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 black is going to take with a tempo. Yeah, but so what? Black is not developed. Queen takes e4 check. You can just cover with the bishop. You could play bishop e3. That's a slightly safer move and then just go knight c3 with a huge development advantage. If black takes with a pawn, it's similarly not scary. It's just a threat. You go knight f4, and black's position is in shambles. Much like the previous game, you're going to go bishop c4, then queen h5 is going to become a big threat. This is a total disaster. So queen e7 is not the main move. Bishop d6 is the main move. And here, I recommend a line that's very practical and very easy to remember. So, of course, you play d4. Black recovers the pawn, and now you play the move bishop to c4, um, which forces the response. Bishop takes e5. Black has literally no other way to defend the f7 pawn. None. Because obviously, if bishop e6, then you can take and deliver the check and take. Here, this works. Okay? So black has to take. And here, there is something special up your sleeve. Does anybody know what it is? This essentially refutes the elephant gambit, sadly. Yes, it's queen h5, intermediate move. Essentially trading queens, but on your own terms. If black plays, queen takes d4 here. Then there's just a couple of things that you have to memorize. You take, you deliver a check, and then you actually just take the knight. You're kind of anticlimactic, but that's just what you do. There's a couple of games in the database here. One of them continued queen d6, bishop e6 check. Yep. Take the rook, and the queen cannot be trapped on h8. It has too many ways out. Um, what else did people do here? Okay, g6 is the most popular move. But now you just extricate the queen with a check. And after king to d8, you get mated with bishop g5, so you have to go king to d6. That's a pretty bad sign. Knight c3, black is totally busted. So that's that. So therefore, queen e7 is the only serious move here. But now you get into an endgame that's just much better for white. Takes, 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 knight c6. This is all very standard theory. And here you play knight to c3, temporarily sacrificing a pawn. Knight takes e5, bishop to b3, and black simply cannot keep the extra pawn. Why is that? Because if black plays knight f6, what is white going to do here? What's white's best move? And this is the same move we play if black plays f5, by the way. Bishop f4, bishop f4, attacking the knight, black collapses, knight c6, you can actually go knight b5 and take with the knight, you're winning. Knight g6, you take the pawn, castle, black's position is terrible. That's basically all there is to it. If black plays f5, doesn't really change anything. Here you can go knight b5 right away, forcing black to move the king to the d file, which is a disaster. Because you're going to go castle's queen side with a quick checkmate. Anyways, you can uh, figure this out on your own, but that's the line that I, I recommend, and that's all you have to know. Uh, you know, plus or minus some, some sidelines. But d takes e4, I've actually never studied. 
I know this is supposed to be bad. According to the computer, bishop c4 is the best move. And here, ah, I was afraid of this move. I was afraid of this move. Okay, this is really cool. Bishop takes f7 check. I thought the black can go king e7. Now, you guys should be able to see why I was afraid of this. I was like, well, these pieces are kind of scattered. But white has a really cool resource here. f4. And this works because if black takes on passant, you play knight takes f3, hitting the queen. But wait, that's not the end of the story. Black is a check, moving the king out of the way, and black can't take the bishop because of the fork. <laughs> and you're threatening rookie one, so king f2 is in our favor as well. Super cool. Other than that, I mean, black can, of course, play a move like knight f6, but then you go c3 and you chase the queen away and go d4, and you're winning. So something I didn't know. The most popular move here is queen to g5. And here, you're supposed to play d4. Okay, here it's pretty straightforward. d4 takes, takes. You can also play it in the other move order. doesn't matter. King to e7. Rook to f1. Bishop to h3. Oh, and simply bishop to c4. Drop the bishop back, protect the rook, and you have a decisive development advantage. I see some games in the database here. Knight f6, bishop f4. Yeah, nothing, nothing special here. Knight b to d7, for example. Queen to d2. You're going to go knight c3, and you're going to castle queenside, and black's king is going to get caught in the crossfire. So this, this one is pretty, pretty simple to understand. The best move is bishop c4, but we decided to play it safe with d4. Of course, if I were playing black, I would play on passant. And here we can take with the knight, or we could take with the bishop. And white is slightly better, and white has a small development advantage, but it's a very modest advantage because black should be able to equalize here with careful play. Okay, but there is stuff that I don't know in the opening, and as you can see, it's, you, you can know everything, but queen h4, bishop c4 is already a disaster. And obviously knight f6 loses the game, but I don't know if there was anything black could have done, really. Maybe bishop e6, but, I mean, just look at these pawns. This is very, very ugly. I think the main takeaway is do not rush to play a move like g3. That's a reactive move. But a piece like this on h4, while it may look annoying, it actually could work in your favor. That's what I was trying to indicate. I didn't see this tactic at this point. But I know from experience that a queen that's unsupported like this in the opening can be susceptible to a bunch of different types of tactics. So don't rush to chase these pieces out of your territory. They can be beneficial to you. And bishop g5, of course, is a tactic worth remembering. Deflection, decoy, and then a fork and a win. So a lot of miniatures today. We managed to get in four games, I think. Yep, four games. Hope you enjoyed. I think this was a nice middle ground between like blitz, blitz ish, but gave us time to explain the moves. Thanks, guys. I'm I'm beat. I'm gonna go get some rest. Um, but for now, have a good start to your weekend. See you guys later.